This is He of Boundless Faith, a Not Alone Origins Story, written by Craig A. Falconer, narrated by James Patrick Cronin. Introduction When Timo Fiori invited an inexperienced journalist by the name of Truman Carr to document his life over the course of a challenging and pivotal summer, both men emerged from the link-up in a far better position than when they'd entered. The Italian billionaire's typically private nature ensured that huge attention fell on Truman's serialized articles, while the three-dimensional picture they painted of a privileged but well-intentioned man did much for Timo's public image among a young American audience in particular. It was the casual closeness of Truman's style and the relentless attention he paid to small details that led Timo to choose him from an essentially unlimited field of talent, all of whom would have jumped at the chance to spend two months in Ispra, documenting how the other half lived. These elements of the youngster's work were seen in a moderately popular but extremely well-reviewed series of free articles on odd urban legends and related curiosities in his home state of New York. That series, What's True, Man, enjoyed a colossal spike in readership once the all-access Timo interview took the internet by storm. In the months and years that followed, Truman had since become hot property. Each high-profile engagement led to more name recognition and even bigger commissions, culminating in his selection as Valerie Slater's shadow during the tense final weeks of her successful presidential campaign. As one of only four people in the room when Slater got word that she had taken Florida to seal the election victory, Truman was the envy of every other media figure in the world. Indeed, that had been the moment that made him a real media figure in his own right, taking him from a familiar name to a familiar face. His inside scoop on the Slater campaign, in turn, led to an appearance on Focus 2020, and with it a handful of lucrative endorsements and speaking engagements. While Truman's personal highlight remained the three weeks he spent on location with Hollywood starlet Caitlin Judd during her filming of the vampire blockbuster Lair of Fangs, the glowing reception to his politically neutral writings on Slater's groundbreaking victory remained his greatest source of professional pride. As the third anniversary of Truman's initial meeting with Timo approached, a surprise phone call from Italy made him wonder if a return trip was in the offing. But not only was this not the case, few requests could have been more surprising than the one Timo made. Rather than inviting Truman back to the lake house in Ispra, Timo wanted him to trail self-styled disclosure activist Billy Kendrick and write a piece on the controversial figure's experiences in staging an ambitious nationwide speaking tour. Truman was familiar with Kendrick and knew that Timo had taken it upon himself to fund many of the expenses associated with the aforementioned tour, seemingly purely because Timo bought what Kendrick was selling and shared his enthusiasm for all things extraterrestrial. After how good Timo had been for Truman's career, and how generously the youngster had been treated throughout his stay in Italy, there was nothing Truman wouldn't have done in thanks. He would have agreed to spend three months trailing a ball of tumbleweed if Timo had asked him to. And truth be told, he didn't see the Kendrick link-up as being all that far away from such a scenario. An in-depth piece on someone like Billy Kendrick would have felt like a golden ticket for Truman a few years earlier, but in comparison to his recent work, it now sounded decidedly second-rate. He was, nevertheless, willing to give it a shot, trying to internally frame it as a fun return to the kind of what's true man articles he had written on all things weird and wonderful before one caught Timo's eye enough to set the wheels of his later career in motion. Timo explained back then that he'd read enough to see Truman as a rare judge of character, capable of narrowing in on tiny traits and weaving his growing awareness of their significance into compelling narratives. When making the request for Truman to trail Billy Kendrick, Timo restated this point and insisted that Billy would readily reveal himself as deeper and more complex than anyone knew. All he was waiting for was someone like Truman to pay close enough attention. When he accepted Timo's offer with only a vague understanding of why the Italian cared enough about Billy Kendrick's public image to make it, Truman could never have imagined that something even more remarkable would occur while he was at Billy Kendrick's side than had occurred when he was at Valerie Slater's. On the other side of things, 
Not even the tirelessly optimistic Billy would have believed how consequential the events of one particular afternoon they'd share in Kentucky would prove. Trailing Billy Kendrick through times of ridicule and even harassment in a pre-disclosure era, when the former archaeologist's name was the first in most minds whenever a question about alien life was realized, Truman Carr was all set up to document far more than he bargained for. The Alien Guy His hat looks like it's made of hemp fiber instead of tinfoil, but my first impressions of Billy Kendrick aren't much different from what I expected. He travels alone, always searching or always selling, depends who you ask, and he does it in clothes and cars so modest that the getup feels like a conscious element of his everyman persona. Like silence hits you stronger than quietness, Billy's heightened plainness stands out. Ah, Truman, he says, catching sight of me at the hotel reception desk. He's near the front of the line and there's a smile along with his words. I'll come down to the bar for a chat once I get everything ready for the show. Call it five o'clock? Five works for me. I didn't expect a sit-down meeting today, and especially not a few hours before the first show of this make-or-break speaking tour, but here we are. Here is Dallas, the Beanstalks City Convention Resort, to be precise, and Billy is in his element. The receptionist is joined by a concierge when Billy reaches the desk, and the greetings are effusive. The welcomes and the thank yous flow from the sharp-suited concierge like warm champagne bubbles, understandable in the context of Billy's fans having booked out the whole hotel, but Billy looks like he'd be more comfortable if the guy really was spraying a bottle all over him. In all the things I've read, humble is the word that kept coming up. I knew of Billy Kendrick before Timo asked me to follow him around for the next few weeks. One of the first things my research told me was that very few people really know him, and he seems to prefer it that way. Other reporters and interviewers say he's an affable guy, patient, friendly, quiet. Above all else, though, humble keeps coming up. They say he's easygoing about almost everything, but single-minded in his focus on what counts most. Aliens. Aliens, aliens, aliens. In all the videos I've watched and all the articles I've read, the only time Billy ever interrupted anyone was when he was introduced as a UFO researcher. There's a lot more to it than that, he insisted, sticking to his pleasant tone even while taking pains to make the distinction. My perception of Billy changed a little bit when he said that, because I always think you can read a lot into the small words people use, those little throwaway words that automatically fall out and pass most people by are sometimes the ones that say the most. And Billy clearly isn't a guy to say, there's a lot more to me than that. It's only one little word, but it gets to the heart of what this is all about. In the decades since Billy burst into public consciousness as the alien guy, he's always maintained it's not about him. He presents himself as a guy who's trying to get the truth out, and he always says his ideal world would see someone else taking this limelight. He's definitely grown more comfortable in the public eye than he was at first, but there are often some hints in his demeanor that he wishes he'd never taken the leap all those years ago. Over the course of this 52-date nationwide speaking tour, one that's taking us from coast to coast and border to border, I'm going to have a chance to dive deeper into Billy's psyche than anyone else ever has. If there are any skeletons in his closet, they'll come out. If he has a breaking point for all the attention that comes his way, we'll reach it. I took this gig with Timo Fiore's assurance that I'd have unlimited access to anything and everything, and Billy signed up for that too. I'm glad there's so much more to Billy's focus than UFOs, because to my mind that whole side of things isn't the most important or the most interesting. He talks a lot about cover-ups, conspiracies, signals from space, lost artifacts. That stuff is right up my street, as anyone who's been around since the What's True Man days will know, and the chance to get the latest thoughts on all that stuff from the horse's mouth is a big part of why I'm here. I want to talk about Billy's plans for this tour. I want to talk about where Timo fits into all of this, and I want to talk about what the relentless critiques of the past 11 years have done to a man whose alien proclamations took him from respected archaeologist to a figure of fun. 
Did he ever see this level of scrutiny coming? Would he do things differently if he had his time again? Billy Kendrick would be first to tell you he's not a UFO researcher. He's a disclosure activist. He's pushing every day for governments to disclose the secrets he's sure they're hiding, and he speaks with the certainty of a man who knows the time is coming. In Billy's world, it's all a case of when, not if. My task here is to get him to disclose things he never has. But if anything else happens while I'm with him, well, I won't be complaining. If and when the truth bombs start dropping, I'm ready. Opening up I don't like being late, but one of the first new things I learned about Billy is that he loves being early. He's sitting in the far corner of the hotel bar when I make my way down at 4.55, and he's already most of the way through a big old pile of chips and dip. Stress eating, he mumbles, wolfing down another mouthful even as he speaks. I take my seat. This is a guy who's been on Focus 2020 twice, drawing huge figures each time, and who literally has his name in lights on the outside of the building we're sitting in. Of all the things I expected from Billy Kendrick, nerves weren't one of them. There's a beer waiting for me, a perfectly frosted brown glass bottle that's fresh from the ice bucket, so I take a refreshing swig before replying. You don't need to stress, man. I'm a nice guy once you get to know me. Billy laughs freely and heartily at this, just like I hoped, decisively puncturing any early tension that might have been lingering between us. If it has the side effect of easing the understandable stresses he might be feeling about the upcoming premiere show of a tour he's hitched all of his hope to, I'll be doubly glad. Timo said I'd like you, he says with another chuckle. I guess you know this link-up was all his idea. I hope you don't feel like I'm crashing your party, I say. I do hope that, because this whole thing very obviously was Timo's idea. I don't fully understand why Timo was so set on bringing us together when Billy does such a good job of promoting himself. The theory might be that I'll get him to reveal more of himself than anyone from the corporate media conglomerates he hates so much ever could, but even that brings me back to the question of why an expansion of Billy's public image matters so much to Timo in the first place. We talk about that for a few minutes. Or, more to the point, I listen to Billy talking about that for a few minutes. He's the natural talker and I'm the natural listener, so this is a pattern we're both unspokenly certain of falling into. Two minutes is all it takes for me to get some brand new information about the part Timo has played in making this tour work, and I'm quickly stunned by how much he's spent. Granted, it pales in comparison to the money Timo was starting to throw at observatories and space research projects when I first got to know him. Still, though, Timo has funded Billy's travel and accommodation for the duration of the tour, and mine. I figure he put the funding in place to make sure there was no need for the kind of crowdfunding drives that tend to invite patronizing calls about the exploitation of vulnerable and misguided fans, because perception is everything in a game like Billy's. The most virulent criticisms surrounding his work, without doubt, come from people who say he's a con man. They liken him to the mediums who used to pack out fairgrounds and promised to put them in touch with their dead relatives, cashing in on the desperate, the dejected, the delusional, that kind of thing. No one can deny there's a lot of that old southern preacher charm about Billy, but my personal reading is that he's one of the kind who really believes what he's preaching. Billy might be evangelizing about secret truths and hidden connections rather than salvation, and he might not be passing a collection plate around the audiences and the megachurch-like arenas he's going to pack out for the next few months, but the preacher comparison is one I can at least understand. Ticket prices for his two-hour shows are set as low as they could reasonably be, too, especially for the unpracticed premiere tonight, and my layman's view of everything is that Timo is making a concerted play to disarm all the critics who paint Billy as a profiteering charlatan. For sure, accusations of stuff like that are far more damaging than the general ridicule a lot of people throw at him. A lot of us find something naturally lovable about a guy who will stick to his guns, however crazy it all seems, unless we think that guy is doing it for selfish reasons and particularly for economic gain. 
I read Billy's main books in the lead-up to this assignment, including the recent ones that really ask a lot of questions about what the world would look like if undeniable proof of alien visitation came to light. What intrigues me about Billy is how much he gave up all those years ago, when he first stepped into the limelight with his initial comments about ancient alien visitation. He was comfortable and doing well, and the public role of alien-obsessed weirdo isn't exactly one that screams financial rewards. For a guy as smart as Billy Kendrick, and his fierce intelligence shines through after a few minutes of conversation and even more so in his writings, there are easier ways to get by. I had barely started high school when it all kicked off, so the incident passed me by at the time since it wasn't anything to do with video games or girls, but his big announcement on Focus 2020 took everyone by surprise. Archaeologists aren't famous in real life, but Billy was at the top of the field. Some of his early books on ancient civilizations were big sellers without containing anything too controversial, though he discussed theories and asked questions that skirted the line and drew a handful of snide remarks from conservative colleagues, Billy steered away from words like conspiracy and cover-up. He spent the past decade carefully avoiding any definite statements about government cover-ups of specific things, knowing full well that hitching his trailer to the wrong horse could hurt his credibility and always wary of traps being laid in an effort to make him throw weight behind a hoax that could later be exposed. Despite that little qualification, though, he's never shy about shining light on individual sightings or detected phenomena and asking people to make their own minds up. What Billy Kendrick has always been explicit about sharing throughout this last decade, on the other hand, is his absolute conviction that alien beings have visited Earth. It all began when he told tens of millions of Marion de Klerk's primetime viewers that he could no longer live a lie under the oppressive boot of an academic discipline that he saw as having become more interested in funding itself than finding anything else. He read a prepared statement about the way he'd been pressured by his academic publishers to remove certain passages, and went on to suggest that they had, in turn, been pressured by government and military interests to control the dissemination of potentially disruptive information. Some of the language didn't help, and I think if Billy had his time again, he wouldn't have said things like, I will no longer be silenced, in a tone that many took as overly self-important. There was no smoking gun to accompany the declaration, only an affirmation of Billy's utter certainty that extraterrestrial beings had engaged with early humans and played a key role in enabling, or at least inspiring, the construction of Earth's grandest ancient monuments. The links are there if you look for them, he told the viewing public, and I sit here today promising one thing. I'll spend as long as it takes making sure they're seen and making sure that the dark forces who want to keep the truth to themselves are exposed for what they are. Since then, Billy has explained why he was so uncharacteristically short-tempered that night. He was invited onto the show to promote his just-published book about the apparent commonalities between ancient civilizations, which developed similar technologies and cultural behaviors at similar times, despite the vast distances between them, and was all set to be the star panelist throughout a 20-minute segment devoted solely to that topic. Just hours before the show went live, however, he learned that the book's U.S. distribution had been paused at the last minute. Learning of this in an email from his equally upset literary agent rather than in a call from the university he had served for so many years pushed Billy over the edge. He had been pressured on repeated occasions to remove certain statements and had usually agreed that the purpose of an academic work was, after all, to shine a light on facts and allow conclusions to be drawn rather than to prescribe beliefs upon the reader. The sudden and ruthless way in which the rug had been pulled from under him on this occasion, however, was something else altogether. For starters, the impersonal approach was entirely at odds with the long-standing relationship he'd enjoyed with his publisher for many years until that point, during which both parties had been very happy with sales figures that were excellent for the sector without making anyone rich overnight. Even more noticeably, though, was how late the intervention had come. Intervention was a word Billy homed in on immediately, insisting that someone had to have gotten to the publisher and leaned on them with some kind of threat. A country whose governmental and military forces can bully an academic publisher into censoring itself is not a free country, he said at the time, 
and actions like this call into question the government's motives as well as raising the bigger question of where else they're throwing their weight around like this. Things took a turn when Billy's publisher insisted that the university's board had become aware of overly speculative content in the book only when a pre-publication review of the British edition called into question whether such sci-fi nonsense had any place in a serious work. The board acted quickly, deeming that Billy's six-page concluding essay could have harmed the university's standing if published in its current form. A lengthy legal battle ensued as Billy tried to wrestle the publishing rights back, which is a story for another day, but the explosive books he's written since then are much bigger deals anyway. That one was just the fire that lit the touch paper, the butterfly whose wings kicked the whole thing off. The underlying reason my mind is currently running a thousand miles an hour as it tries to make sense of the endlessly intriguing man at the other side of this table. As part of my research, I actually watched that episode of Focus 2020 for the first time just a few days ago. We've been talking for a little while when I decide to share my thoughts on it with Billy, admitting that at first glance I could understand why some people thought it looked like a stunt. Did you think it looked like a stunt? He asks, role reversing himself into my interviewing shoes. I measure my reply. It looked like something present day Billy wouldn't do. This is the simplest and truest way I can think of to put it, because the Billy of ten years ago simply wasn't the polished and precise speaker he is now. The way he snapped at some of the mocking remarks that came his way wasn't exactly becoming of someone who wanted to be taken seriously as a lone pursuant of truth. Don't you agree? I push. How about we get together tomorrow morning and have a rewatch of the whole thing? He suggests, instantly making me wonder why I hadn't thought of the very same thing. Or both of my appearances, to see the differences. You know I haven't watched a full replay of either show. Ever. My mind whirred for a few seconds until the initial fragments of what seemed like a good idea came together into something I started to think could be great. You're filming your show for a home media and streaming release, right? Huge part of the business plan for breaking even on Timo's investment, he says with a nod. What if we could secure rights to those two episodes of Focus 2020 and some deal with the network, and we record a reaction video of the watch-along? You can talk about what you were feeling at the time, share some little insights. Kind of like a director's commentary you'd get as a DVD extra. Billy's lip upturns a little as he mulls it over. I'm glad I added the director's commentary reference at the end there because his expression had been blank until then. Generational disconnect. I should have figured reaction videos and watch-alongs probably aren't regular features of his vocabulary. Let's do it he says with sudden decision. Do you want to record it soon and let Timo figure out the rights licensing sometime before we release it? Definitely, I say. Hell, I want to record it tomorrow morning on the way to the next city, or tonight after the first show. I would do it this weekend, but so much of my focus is on making sure the first few nights run smoothly. He goes on, seemingly reading my mind. That's why we're not filming until next week, either. We want to make sure we iron out all the kinks. Pretty much all tours are the same, I say. Bands, comics, they always film near the end of their run and when they get to the most iconic venue. I'm excited to see your show tonight, though. This is a great place to start. Billy gulps away the last of his chips, holding my eyes as a slow smile builds. And Myrtle Beach is a great place to finish. He's talking about the E.T. Weekender, of course, a huge outdoor event he's organized for the end of the tour. It's an eye-wateringly ambitious undertaking on the scale of a mainstream music festival, but the happiness on Billy's face as he thinks about it leave me in no doubt that he's sure it's all going to work out. Billy has an easy air about him that makes you feel like things are going to work out, and I'm surprising myself by feeling and writing that. He just seems like the kind of guy who's never going to be flustered, which is pretty amazing when you consider all the flack that comes his way. I've gone from being curious about how the next few months would play out to being excited about getting to know him. There's a lot to look forward to with tonight's show and anything else that might happen before our 2020 rewatch next week, but the personal aspect is coming to the fore in a way I didn't think it would. 
We spent maybe 20 minutes talking about whatever came to our minds, and at no time has he laid down a single ground rule for my access all areas status. There were no formal introductions, no discussions of what either of us hoped to get from this unusual traveling arrangement, and really not much beyond general chatter. It was more pleasant and personal than I expected, without doubt, and the easy expression he's been wearing for most of it tells me that the feeling is mutual. As the clock nears 5.30 and Billy's phone buzzes to remind him of the need for a final rehearsal of his entrance and opening of the 7 p.m. show, he even goes out of his way to tell me that he doesn't expect me to go to every single show. Sitting through the same presentation night after night would get boring, even when the presenter is him, he says with a grin, but he's very clear that he does want me to be there tonight. He says it's important for me to get a sense of the strength of feeling his audience has for the subject matter he's sharing, and I couldn't agree more. While I wouldn't miss tonight for the world, I am pretty glad he said the other part too, because I'm expecting way more value from my time with Billy between shows than I could possibly get from rewatching the same thing over and over again. The only rewatch I'm looking forward to is Focus 2020, and I've got a real feeling that experience alone is going to bring enough unique insights to make my final piece on this experience more than worthwhile. Billy is a private man despite his outward friendliness, and it's a great sign that he seems to have taken to me so quickly. I'm not naive enough to think I've done a whole lot of charming in my own right, and I know Timo's word goes a long way in Billy's ear, just like it does in my own. Timo has done his part in bringing us together. Now it's on us. We'll talk tomorrow, Billy says, but I've got to run. See you out there, front row. Best seat in the house, I smile. I shouldn't have expected anything less. Billy sets off, any signs of tension gone. Oh, and the beer's taken care of, he calls after suddenly stopping in his tracks. I raise it and tip it his way. Thanks, Billy. Break a leg. On the Road It's been a hell of a few weeks. Everywhere we go, there's a crowd waiting to greet Billy. There are no crying teenagers like when I spent time with Caitlin Judd. There are no Secret Service agents like when I was embedded with President Slater. And there are no egg throwers like there sometimes were when I was with Timo before his PR reinvention. What there is, at every hotel and every arena, is a far more demographically diverse crowd than I would have expected. Maybe this is my prejudice talking, but I think it's going to be a pretty common one. And even after all the nights that have come before, I never cease being surprised by how varied the makeup of the welcome parties is. If I asked you to picture the kind of people who would not only show up for a public speaking tour about alien disclosure, as Billy always calls it, but who show up at the speaker's hotel several hours before the show, well, wouldn't you have a certain image in your head? Billy is in his mid-fifties, but has one of those soft-featured faces that's grown into itself over the years, aided by the perfectly managed white hair and stubble that frame it all. None of that is to say he's getting that kind of attention from the crowds that gather. Ever since we left Dallas the morning after the first show, and I'll have more on the show later, Billy and I have traveled together. That was always the plan and was probably the one thing I was most worried about, since all those miles would have been a real slog if we hadn't ended up getting along as well as we do. That means we arrived together, but I've been absolutely insistent on letting Billy get out first. My old focus on curious stories back in the What's True Man days means there's definitely a greater than average crossover between his audience and the people out there who know my face from the limited TV work I've done, and I really don't want to take any attention from him. Timo didn't lay that down as a rule, and while Billy appreciated my suggestion, he didn't think it was anything worth worrying about. In any case, I've taken to listening through a slightly opened window while Billy warmly engages with the people who gather to greet him. We're never entirely sure how they know which hotel he's going to be checking into, and for the sake of comfort, it's sometimes easiest to assume they're just guessing. It's always a gravison if the city has one, so that usually makes it easy enough for the diehards to catch an early sight of their man. The word cult is the stupidest one I've heard fired in Billy's direction. He doesn't really inspire devotion, let alone seek to do so, and he doesn't seem to have any literal followers, at least judging by the lack of repeat faces in each city. 
I guess it would take a special kind of enthusiast to follow a disclosure activist around the country to watch the same two-hour presentation every night. What sometimes happens is that the most vocal of Billy's fans jump to his defense when barbed criticism comes at him online, and it could be the case that his general opposition to societal authorities and penchant for highlighting varied conspiracy theories attracts a subset of fans prone to seeing a mortal enemy in the form of any mild critic. A handful of incidents have reflected pretty badly on Billy and forced him to respond, like when the hardcore fans have coordinated campaigns to leave swaths of scathing reviews on books written by individuals he's debated certain issues with. Subtlety isn't their strong suit, or their intent, but I can fully understand the line Billy has to walk in dealing with things like that. He's never encouraged bad behavior, so this isn't one of those cases when someone ends up being eaten by the metaphorical tiger they've used as an attack dog. But if Billy was to come out with overly strong criticisms of people who think they're helping him, he would quite possibly find himself in the jaws pretty quickly. So far it feels like those extreme fans live exclusively online, because there's never been a hint of questionable behavior in or around any of the shows. There hasn't even been any need for security at the hotels, even though the numbers are growing steadily by the night thanks to people posting their videos on social media and inspiring copycat greetings. Mobs would be far too strong a word because even today's peak only saw around 20 people, but I think it might not be too long until we do need some kind of cordon. Not that there's any kind of threat, mainly just so there's a queuing system of sorts so that no one misses out or has to wait longer than they should. What they're usually waiting for is the chance to snap a selfie with a man they have a lot of respect for, and sometimes an autograph on their official program. Billy always obliges, rain or shine, and sticks around until he's spoken to everyone. This is another thing that might have to change soon, especially since the last two hotels have seen crowds gathering outside for our departure the day after the show we were in town for. Once our hotel location is confirmed by all the initial videos and posts online, People know where we're staying and know the rough time we'll be leaving for the next stop. I also sense a change in the way Billy is being welcomed at the hotels. The convention centers, like in Dallas, have been happy to have us, due to all the fans that book out the rooms. Those places depend on that kind of thing. Whereas the higher-end gravisons we've been staying at for the last few nights don't seem overly enamored with the mini rabbles that gather outside. I wouldn't want to make assumptions, but part of it could also be that Billy doesn't exactly dress to the nines for travel and check-in, and although there's no official dress code at the Gravison, his ultra-casual get-ups do make him stand out in the reception halls like a green Martian would stand out at one of the nightly shows. In fact, the Martian would probably get friendlier looks. I've enjoyed two full shows so far, the first two, and it's safe to say the surprises have kept on coming. Not just in terms of the audience, although there have been questions at the end from an incredible cross-section of professions. I'm talking everything between NASA analysts asking if Billy thinks everyone in positions of scientific authority are liars, he doesn't, and kindergarten teachers asking if he thinks the possibility of sentient aliens should be discussed with young children, he does. The show in itself is an absolute masterclass of a lecture so much so that you completely forget you're watching a single presenter for two hours and feel more like you're listening in on an intriguing conversation for a couple of wonder-packed minutes. I had read the book it's largely based on, but this made me see things in a whole new light. When Billy was finished running through his five scenarios for disclosure, I was champing at the bit for more. He took a broad historical look at how new discoveries have changed interactions within and between different civilizations, with persuasive step-by-step -step rundowns on what he thought would happen in several different situations, whether it might be a whistleblower stepping forward with irrefutable proof of a deliberate cover-up, or maybe the observable appearance of an alien object or signal in our solar system. He didn't spend too long on the potential negative consequences, it's an upbeat show, but he didn't gloss over them either. Don't imagine society in the grip of a zombie apocalypse, but do imagine a pandemic he said, predicting major shortages of crucial items if supply lines were disrupted by uncertainty and absenteeism. An important distinction Billy often makes is around what he calls capital D disclosure, which is the kind we'd see if President Slater was to sit down and tell us that we are not alone. As optimistic as he is, 
Billy doesn't see that one coming soon. He thinks we might see a drip feed of previously classified information, perhaps intended to make it look like the government is being open and perhaps in an effort to make the general public less interested or concerned by way of diluting the topic. On a similar theme, he used an analogy for that issue that was new to me and didn't feature in his book. He called it the little fly lie. The crux of the analogy was that if a kid is scared of wasps and thinks he sees one flying around by the doorway, telling him that there's nothing there isn't going to do any good. He knows he saw something, or at least truly thinks he did, and he's worried it might be a wasp. But not only does denial make him think there's still a scary thing at the window, the associated dismissal makes him lose a degree of trust in your ability and desire to protect him. Telling the child, it's just a little fly, is far more effective, Billy said. Bringing a dead fly as proof is even more effective, naturally, and that's why we occasionally see the declassification of old tapes that show once secret military planes doing weird maneuvers. In Billy's mind, explained in a manner that makes a lot of sense, that's the government's way of telling us the wasp is just a little fly. He continues the analogy from there and branches it off to say that when a child faces real problems, which could be anything from the economic difficulties of parental job loss or an increase of home break-ins in their local area, the parent would be better served to keeping those quiet. Those issues are handled and guarded against without the child having to be troubled by them. And Billy thinks a degree of thinking occurs along those lines within governments. Issues surrounding potential or actual extraterrestrial contact are deemed as something beyond the realm of public discussion, he figures, much like the murky realities of things like enhanced interrogation of terrorist suspects. No amount of little fly lies can neatly put those issues back in their box, so it's best to keep the lid sealed altogether. So what's the big difference? I'll let Billy's words take over. We are not children, and the government is not our parents. As he went on to say, our taxes pay their wages and the social contract on which everything rests is based on consent and trust. Lies destroy both. On our travels, I spent more than a little time talking to Billy about his speaking skills. That sounds pretty meta when I put it like that, but he really is a skilled orator. He talks with the ease of a practiced politician, in contrast with the handful of pre-outburst TV appearances when a much younger and more somber version of himself appeared on minor TV and radio shows to promote his old books. There's definitely a lesson there, that you can teach an old dog new tricks, or rather it can diligently endeavor to teach itself. Billy clearly wasn't born with the gift of the gab, but he strikes you as someone who must have been. I've been around a lot of actors and performers in my career, but I've never been spellbound the way I am when Billy gets into his flow on stage. It's not all that surprising when he tells me that he's studied the speech patterns and mannerisms of everyone from infomercial hosts to youth hypnotherapists, and the very fact that's not surprising tells you a lot about how impressed I've been by him. He tells me he's drilled down on cadence, vocabulary, pace, intonation, and frankly a bunch of other words I didn't understand or even recognize. It's insufficient to say he did his homework and more accurate to say he did everything in his power to become the man he is today. The quality of Billy's delivery perfectly complements the quality of the content he shares, and he says with a good degree of pride that he's been studying the art of public speaking ever since his first appearance on Focus 2020. Our rewatch is penciled in for tomorrow, and this is another helpful piece of information to learn. It seems like everything changed for Billy on that fateful day when he crossed the Rubicon and decisively nailed his colors to the mast of ancient alien visitation, so much so that he vowed it would never happen again. Never again would he use suboptimal language and mannerisms to communicate an important point. Never again would he deliver an already difficult message in a way that would give it anything but the very best chance of being heard. The guy's diligence is never-ending. We're currently heading to Nebraska as I'm writing this, bright and early, and we're all set to record the Focus 2020 reaction video, aka Director's Commentary, in the afternoon. It's going to be a good day, with another sellout show to follow, but Billy has spent the drive re-watching footage from the question and answer session at the end of last night's show. This is the one part that changes each time, 
and since he truly doesn't vet the questioners beforehand, he has to be ready for anything, and is sometimes momentarily taken by surprise. That wasn't the case last night. No major misspoken points or even obvious speaking errors, however minor, but this doesn't stop him from poring over every one of his facial expressions and barely perceptible vocal tics. Because the Q&A session is also when he has to think of coherent and smooth answers on the spot, in contrast to the tirelessly rehearsed two-hour presentation that comes before, he likes to retrospectively formulate and internalize a perfect answer to each question, so he has it in the bag for next time. There's so much more to the show than meets the surface, which is a statement that's equally true of Billy as a man. I've had a ball in the hotel bars, shooting pool and shooting the breeze with a guy I was worried about having nothing in common with. He really is someone who could have devoted himself to just about any field and been successful in it, so I find the fact that he's chosen to do this endlessly interesting. When we get within an hour or so of Lincoln, I hear a great question from a member of last night's audience. Billy is staring at himself on the screen with a level of focus bordering on the frightening, but he also leaves the audio playing through the speakers instead of headphones and clearly doesn't care that me and the driver are listening in. All that matters for Billy here is optimizing his response, but all of a sudden he breaks focus and turns to me. I want to know what you think of this one, he says. He looks at me then instinctively to my laptop screen and he seems surprised that I'm clearly working on this piece. So meta. I'm listening, I say, no word of a lie. The question comes from a young woman, which would have surprised me a few weeks ago, back when I didn't realize how varied the audience was. I didn't hear this question live, so I feel like I'm there as she asks whether Billy ever feels like he's chasing windmills. The goalposts could always be moved, she says, and anyone willing to hide a truth like this in the first place would surely be willing to do whatever it took to make sure it would never be exposed with some skillful deflection taking the shine off things. Billy and I both pay close attention to his recorded reaction, which is a mildly odd experience as he thoughtfully weighs it up and buys some time to develop an answer by saying how much he appreciates the question. Apparently, it was one he'd wrestled with in the past. I'm chasing the truth he says to the attentive questioner, whether some people see that as a quixotic chase or not. Windmill, White House, Area 51, wherever it might be hiding, I'm going to keep doing all I can to bring the truth to light. I can't promise it'll come to light in my lifetime, but I can sure as sugar promise you one thing. Just as fast as these legs will take me, I will never stop chasing. He looks at me with sincere eyes, like he really cares what I thought of the answer. Perfect, I tell him, needing no time to think of my reply. He nods and looks back at the screen, ready to analyze his own next answer. And Billy? Yeah, he asks, this time without looking away. If you ever get tired, I'll be right there beside you. A smile crosses his pristinely groomed face. Good luck keeping up with me, youngster. You better hope you run better than you play pool is all I'm saying. I laugh when he does, but the tone and the smile tell me how he really feels. But for real, Truman, I appreciate that, he adds. Just in case you don't know. And there we have it. The tone and the smile told me, but he added the words because that's the kind of man Billy Kendrick is. He wants people to feel appreciated when they deserve to, and more generally, he wants the people around him to know what he's thinking. Because above all else, he wants you to know the truth. A Tale of Two Twenties Another hotel in another city brings another happy crowd and another frustrated-looking security guard. Billy doesn't let himself feel pressured into hurrying things along and instead takes his usual sweet time to greet all of the well-wishers. When I walk in after he's done, I see t-shirts for a couple of music artists who have been on Billy's much-listened-to podcast, which speaks to the value of the crossover approach he was going for with that whole thing. He figured that the true diehard fans of any celebrity would listen to every interview they could get their hands on, so he cast a very wide net in bringing public figures onto his show and hoped to retain a portion of their fans as his own by intriguing them with the alien-related topics at hand. There's a secondary benefit, too. 
Some of these hugely popular acts are going to be performing at the E.T. Weekender in Myrtle Beach when this tour wraps up, purely following on from the relationships Billy built during their appearances on his show. Clever is as clever does. On the way to our ninth floor rooms, he goes on to explain to me that he felt slightly bad for the security guard having to stand outside in the little splash of rainfall, but qualified it with the consideration that he was getting paid to be there, whereas the fans had taken time out of their days to get there and make Billy feel welcome. I wouldn't worry about it, I say, but Billy is Billy, so he does worry about everyone else. I wouldn't say he worries too much, but maybe more than enough. He sees the spring in my step as we near the rooms, and he knows it's because we're going to re-watch both of his Focus 2020 appearances as soon as I've dropped my luggage in my room and joined him next door. Living out of my suitcase hasn't been as hard as a lot of people would think, maybe because I've done it before on the Timo Fiore and Caitlin Judd assignments, and hardly an hour goes by that Billy doesn't double-check that I have everything I need. Like I said, more than enough. The prospect of the Focus 2020 rewatch is exciting to me because not only is it the first time Billy has been observed and recorded while watching them, he swears it's the first time he's ever watched them in full, at all. He says he knows how bad it went and doesn't have to see it to remind himself, but he's willing to do it for this one-off purpose as a means of underlining how far he's come and document the varying approaches that different people have taken to discredit him over the years. I've seen the first episode pretty recently like I said earlier, but that was before I'd gotten close to Billy. When we finally got everything set up to record in the plush hotel room and start the video on a 58-inch TV, the first thing Billy comments on is how much younger the show's inimitable host, Marion DeClerc, looks. Wait till you see yourself, I quip, but in truth, Billy probably looks better now. Older, obviously, but a lot more deliberate about his appearance. We haven't talked about this, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's a similar situation to his speech. I wouldn't be surprised if he's tried hard to present an image that reduces the potential for ridicule as far as possible and puts his most respectable-looking foot forward. Billy wants me to talk during the commentary overlay we're recording, but I keep my input to a minimum. No one is going to be watching or listening to that because I'm there, and my focus is in turn on how Billy is responding to everything. Before long, he falls into a pattern of conversationally chiming in every now and again without seeming to care that my replies are as minimal as humanly possible. The show is fairly low-key for our purposes, until all of a sudden, it's not. Here I go, Billy says, setting up the cringeworthy rant that made his younger self a figure of ridicule. So much more so than last time, this is hard to watch. It can only be because I've come to know Billy well and now count him as a friend, but this is seriously tough. I want to jump in a time machine and slap him out of it, or at least tell him to hold off until he can phrase it all better. I can't believe I let myself say all that, he says with a chuckle. What I mean is, once I decided to say it, which I can believe, I can't believe that was the speech I came up with to read out. I can only agree. It would be a lot more coherent if you did it today, Billy, and that's what counts. He nods. Still, I wouldn't change a thing. Everything I was made me everything I am, and everything I've done brought me everything I have, he says. These words come out in a way that makes them sound sincerely felt, rather than an attempt to make himself feel better. He already feels better. He feels better than he did, because I sense that in countless ways, he feels like he's better than he was. I didn't know him back then, but from what I've seen, it's a tough point to argue. The rest of that episode is just as tough to watch as a few of the other panelists seem to take joy in mocking Billy, delivering questions he's far less prepared to answer than he would be now. Needless to say, he takes advantage of the opportunity this rewatch is providing and takes it upon himself to answer all of the questions now, along with some witty and occasionally sharp comebacks. It's hilarious and this video is going to be a huge hit. We dive straight into the second episode without so much as standing up to stretch our legs, and from the get-go, you can tell that this Billy has grown a lot since last time. His competence, while less than it is now, admittedly makes this show a little bit less entertaining since it leaves less opportunity for present-day Billy to take over in picking up the slack. During a brief lull when someone is talking about other stuff, Billy gives some background on his personal history with the guy. 
There's a reference to a juicy-sounding legal spat with Blitz Media based on illegal surveillance tactics the desperate company had been using against him and some other high-profile names, but we don't have time to get into it right now while the tape is rolling. Mental note, it's a topic for later. Other than that, not a lot really catches my attention this time. It's not that I ever feel bored, though, but any hint of fading interest is jolted back from whence it came as Billy's phone lets out a cuckoo-like chime from the bed beside us. Schoolboy error, I chide with a mock eye roll. Live mic, live cam. Come on, dude. Sorry, that's a text message, Billy replies. Everything else is silenced. I hardly ever get... Before he finishes the sentence, another chime. Before he reaches for the phone, several more. It's now buzzing and beeping like a drunken robot, and I watch in genuine surprise as the avalanche of notifications carries the phone several inches across the comforter and it literally vibrates itself off the bed. Billy hurries to pick it up from the floor, not at all concerned that it might be damaged from the fall since his wonder over what caused the sudden deluge of messages leaves no room to think about anything else. I know the feeling, but while Billy leans down to reach for his phone, I grab my own from my pocket. I instantly see that it has dozens of notifications too. I just didn't hear them because I'd naturally silenced it for the recording. I unlock the screen and take a look at my messages. Holy shit. Precisely as my eyes almost fall out of my head, the man beside me literally falls out of his chair. The post that's going viral links Billy to something huge. Secret documents found this morning, quarter mile from IDA, files still in hand, 100% real. Hashtag IDA robbery, hashtag Richard Walker, hashtag Billy Kendrick. An image posted along with the text has two shortened URLs, which the two of us race to type in. I'm going for the bottom one. I say, trying to minimize the time it'll take to see what they'll reveal. Good, I'm going for the top, Billy says. I rush to his side as my phone loads the page, and when both phones are loaded, we see that it's the same page. The info has been posted twice in different places for the sake of redundancy if one was taken offline, it seems, but none of that matters in the context of how explosive this all is. Images of remarkable documents quickly fill the screens, from official sources in multiple countries. I keep scrolling and see more scans and images. A handwritten plan to discredit Billy catches my eye and explains why he was mentioned in the post, but the final image is the one that really gets me. In the same handwriting, a semi-torn piece of card opens with a line that could change the world. The alien craft at Toplitz was sunk and destroyed. There's a lot more, all pointing towards a Nazi-era discovery that's apparently been covered up by the American authorities. I can feel my heart pumping like never before. It's a leak, Billy says, glee and joy and unchecked certainty in his tone. Truman, it's a leak. This is it. This stuff came from Walker at the IDA. It doesn't get any bigger. Holy hell. Okay, we'll need a news crew. I'll just reply to this post and tell them where I am. This place will be swarming with cameras in five minutes. Unlike Billy, I'm speechless. It takes me a few seconds to stammer anything out, and when I do, it's just, you really think so? He does. In fact, his face tells me more than that. He knows so. For this to happen while I'm with him, for the road to capital D disclosure to show itself like this, is a blessing I could never have dreamed of. Billy jumps to his feet, shaking off the dust from his excited fall a few minutes ago, and hugs me tight. It's a beautiful thing, and I'm glad you're here for it. I'm struggling to keep my cool now, feeling unusually emotional. Billy is so sure about this, it's infectious. I feel like he's right, and that just warms my heart. It is a beautiful thing to know that sometimes the good guys win, and I've never met a nicer guy than Billy Kendrick. And whoever you are, Billy says, grinning from ear to ear and addressing the anonymous whistleblower through the ninth floor window, his voice a reverent whisper. Thank you. Thank you for listening to He of Boundless Faith, a Not Alone Origins Story, written by Craig A. Falconer, narrated by James Patrick Cronin, a member of SAG-AFTRA. Produced by Blue Nose Audio. 
Production coordination by Candace Lawrence. Post-production by Michael Straza. Copyright 2021 by Craig A. Falconer. All rights reserved.